So thank you for joining this Snack and Learn webinar on uh, health risk assessment of vapor intrusion in, of chlorinated solvents in a residential area. Uh, my name is Lena Torin. Uh, I'm a technical director at WSP in Sweden, um, in Gothenburg, uh, the second largest city in Sweden. I have worked with contaminated land, uh, contaminated by chlorinated solvents and risk assessment with that, and uh, especially health risk assessment related to vapor intrusion for almost 20 years, uh, all the time as a consultant. And actually in this picture, you see two uh, pictures, this one and this one is actually from my very first uh, project on vapor intrusion and chlorinated solvents that I had almost 20 years ago. Um, I work with all parts uh, dealing with land contaminated with uh, chlorinated solvents, investigation, risk assessment, feasibility studies, uh, remediation and monitoring. And, and recently I've also focused a little bit on DNAPOS and other DNAPOS such as PIHs and mercury. But uh, on to this webinar. And uh, first, I want to say that we will have a question and uh, question and uh, answer session in the end of the presentation. So please write your questions in the question box during my presentation. And also, you can already now see um, the handouts. Uh, uh, of the webinar, the slides in the handouts box if you want to download those. So, moving on. Uh, the agenda for this uh, short talk is uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what vapor intrusion is, and then a little bit about what chlorinated solvents are and why they can be a vapor intrusion problem. And then I will go very fast uh, into how I do investigations of chlorinated solvents in residential areas, in sensitive areas. And then I have uh, two short examples, project examples, and some key takeaways before the question and answer uh, session. So first, what is vapor intuition? This is a really simplified basic picture of uh, what uh, this is. And it's uh, what vapor intrusion really is, is that you have a contaminated soil or, or groundwater emanating from that soil uh, where you have a volatile compound that can vaporize from these and go by diffusion up through the soil and further into the building sometimes, or mostly I would say by advection through utility lines or floor cracks and so on. In reality, vapor intrusion is much, much more complicated as you can see in this quite messy picture, but, but good in, a, in another way because it shows some of all the things that affect the vapor intrusion and, and therefore affects the, the concentration you will find in the indoor air in the end. So you can see that you have the air exchange and you have uh, uh, stack effects and wind effects and the barometric pressure and, and a lot of things that affects it. So uh, because of this, you have a big temporal variability of vapor intrusion and the concentration you will find in the indoor air, but also in the sub-slab vapor that is uh, vapor just below the foundation. And this is one of the first uh, research projects where the vapors in the indoor air was measured continuously. Uh, this is almost 15 years ago, a Danish research site. And you can see how it varies just for three days, the whole measurement period is approximately three weeks. And if if you now that there has been several other projects and you can see that if you uh, measure for a year or more, you will normally see the highest concentrations in the late autumn and in, in the, during the winter time, similar to where you have radon problems. And given this, uh, when you do a risk assessment, you need to know 
what the representative concentration is for exposure of the of the people living in the building um, and when you should take the samples and how you should uh, assess it so a little bit about chlorinated solvents um, perk or pcu or tetrachloroethene uh, was used in dry cleaning from the 1950s and, and is still used uh, in dry cleaning and the degradation product of uh, PC or PERC is free, cl free chlor uh, chloroethene or TCE, uh, which is another chlorinated solvent that is, has been used extensively, but more in metal workshops and for degreasing metal and uh, in uh, degreasing electrical parts and so on. So both these chlorinated solvents have been used very much. There are other chlorinated solvents as well as chloroform and tetrachloroethane and so on that has also been used. But I would say that PCE and TCE are the major problems uh, globally and uh, in Sweden. And almost all, or I would say all these chlorinated solvents are toxic or carcinogenic to humans in quite small concentration. It, it varies from uh, product to product and degradation product as well. Uh, but the problem with PERC and, and dry cleaners is that dry cleaners were often located in residential areas. Quite often they were located on the ground floor of a, of a multi-floor building, so with apartments above. So that's uh, something that keeps it a little bit more um, sensitive than uh, when you deal with TC from metal workshops that normally is not located in residential areas. And the problem with all the chlorinated solvents are that they are quite volatile and they don't, uh, at least not PC and TC, don't degrade in, the aerob uh, in aerobic conditions. That is, uh, nothing will really happen with the vapor when it goes from the groundwater and up through the unsaturated zone. And further, all the chlorinated solvents are denapples, dense non-aqueous phase liquids, which means that they can sink through an aquifer and thereby form large persistent contamination. And some of these characteristics that they are volatile and denapples and, and some other things with them makes them very difficult to investigate correct. Oh, sorry. So, uh, what I have uh, done and my colleagues here in, in Sweden have tried to do is to do screening investigation uh, in the beginning of projects to see where should we place our more expensive and more intrusive soil borings. So, um, by non-intrusive, I mean that we don't go in with a big drill rig in a, in a garden or near a residential building. And we uh, some of the techniques we have been using is tree coring, as you can see to the left, where you just use a little drill to get sample from a tree. And we also used uh, sampling of indoor air uh, as a first uh, investigation and uh, soil gas sampling, mostly sub slab soil gas sampling, as you can see in this picture here where we do sub slab and also we have sampled water and air in uh, sewer or stormwater pipes and sometimes we do camera inspections before that. So our uh, first little project this was a really uh, really big but still small project. We were retained by the county administrative board here around Gothenburg to uh, do uh, screening investigation of 43 former dry cleaners. Uh, they had actually more than, I think, 350 dry cleaners within the county, but out of this they had screened out 43 that were especially sensitive and where they thought there might be a risk because of how they were placed and um, the historic. So, we did a uh, small, very cheap investigation of all these 43 former dry cleaners with just indoor air, sub slab, soil gas and tree core. So we did multiple sites on one day uh, and we also gather more historic data and so on. 
And what we found was that the indoor air actually gave the best indication of contamination, uh, better than the sub slab, at least when you just do a few sub slabs, like one or two that was in this uh, case. And we also found that tree cores were surprisingly good, given that we actually sampled in the late autumn and it even snowed uh, when we took some of the samples. We also found an uh, interesting thing that we had background concentration of carbon tetrachloride, another um, chlorinated solvent that is not uh, related to uh, PERC. And we found um, almost the same very low concentration and, and later we found out that this was something that was phased out globally in 1989, but it's still around the globe everywhere uh, in these concentrations. But we didn't really see it until we did all these 43 former dry cleaners in 43 uh, different uh, locations. We saw that we, we have really the same concentration everywhere. So out of these seven new high-risk objects were identified out of the 43 and uh, um, then the different uh, municipalities uh, got the information and could go further with uh, more investigation of these high-risk objects. So we found it a good tool for prioritizing further investigation. And now I will go into a little bit of a bigger uh, project. This was done by my colleagues uh, here at WSP. Uh, it's a former dry cleaner in Helsingborg that operated from 1929 to the end of the 1970s. Then it was demolished and uh, villas were built on top of it in the 1980s, as this one you see on the picture. Uh, this one is actually demolished now for further investigations. And the reason is, you can see the orange uh, chlorinated solvents plume that's uh, just under this building. And that was done by uh, passive sampling and we also did active sampling, uh, pumping over carbon tubes. Uh, that was done at three, three different times and you can see um, some different kind of concentration varying a little bit. And all these concentration is actually outside of the building. So under the building, there are probably higher concentrations. And then indoor air was also sampled and not just at one time, but this is, this is for one of the uh, investigation and, and also indoor air, or not indoor air, but air in the crawl space under the building was also, uh, investigated and sampled. And you can see the concentrations here, which was much higher than the tox value, which was 200 micrograms per cubic meter. And you measured 379. So it was a really big problem. So it was actually this villa uh, and the neighboring villa was mitigated already uh, during uh, this investigation phase. Uh, with ventilated floor and so on. But as I said, it's now demolished, but that's because of other things. And at this site, um, we use something called multiple lines of evidence. Uh, that is testing different media, such as groundwater and soil gas and air and soil at multiple locations. So not only one soil gas samples, but maybe two at a different depth and, and the same for groundwater and so on. And when you use this and you use it together with uh, modeling of uh, what the concentration should be, you can interpret uh, all the data and uh, build your conceptual site model of how the contaminant is, uh, is in the ground and how it transports the receptors, the people in the building and so on. And why should you use this? It's just to make a better uh, assessment and it also can help you to see if you have a complete uh, vapor intrusion pathway or if you have background issues such as we saw in the, in the first greening investigation where we saw the carbon tetrachloride. In this case, uh, we had concentration measured uh, up in the building and in the crawl space and the soil gas and in the in, in this groundwater up here. 
And if you just calculate the dilution, you will see uh, have some quite ordinary uh, dilution from the crawl space up to the indoor air and from the soil gas and, and so on. But the problem was, uh, or, or if, then we also did a Johnson Etting model. There is a Swedish uh, soil vapor model, but it's quite simplified. So we had to use the Johnson Etting here in this case. And when you use that and went from the groundwater and up to from the soil gas uh, up to the indoor air, you could get a really good um, correlation to what you actually measured. So it all seemed to make sense. But we had some deep groundwater with much higher, an order of magnitude higher concentration down here, the blue line. And uh, if you look at that, you had a really much higher uh, uh, dilution from that. So the deep groundwater plume didn't really seem to affect the indoor air. And why is that? Um, sorry. The reason is really that uh, uh, this cleaner water acts as sort of a water trap for the for the concentration going up. So it was really important that we did this investigation of the shallow uh, groundwater. So we did a, a good modeling. Another problem you can have is if you have utility lines or pipes acting as preferential pathway. And this is uh, another example uh, with just what we found in uh, different places when we measured. So we measured both in the basement and the ground floor and on upper floors and, and also in the soil gas, in the sewer lines and in the stormwater pipes. And looking at these figures, you sort of see that it's probably not the soil gas that is the problem for, for the vapor intrusion. In this case, it's probably the sewer line that acts as a transport pathway. Um, I forgot to mention that in, in this Raven site, what we ended up with um, recommending was we couldn't really make a final recommendation of, of remediation in, the, in that case because there were too many knowledge gaps uh, when we did the investigation. And that's one of the reasons why the by, by why the villa is now demolished because uh, it was uh, too much uncertainties. But you, you sort of saw that you had to do some kind of source treatment and also some injections to do something about the plume. And I said that uh, it, the villa was already mitigated when the investigation was done. And um, now there have been much, many more investigation at that site uh, to be able to take a final decision on remediation at the site. And, and the reasons are not uh, longer only vapor intrusion for the neighbors. It's uh, foremost actually uh, the drinking water uh, downstream that site. But going to conclusions and the key takeaways here is that uh, we find that non-intrusive investigation methods are really valuable for screening and seeing where to place your more intrusive uh, soil borings and so on. And, and in many cases, we have found other sources that we wouldn't have seen if we had just gone with soil borings and groundwater uh, wells. And we also see that indoor air concentration vary, and it can vary with several order of magnitudes over time. So you can't only sample at one occasion. And I mean, that's also, um, that, that goes for the groundwater as well when you deal with contaminated, with chlorinated solvents. And as I said, generally you get the highest concentration during late autumn and winter. Uh, you also need to be uh, aware that the vapor plume don't move in the way the groundwater plume does. So you can have the vapor plume moving uh, upstream the groundwater or transgradient the groundwater plume. 
because the sewer lines and the utility and utility trenches they act as preferential pathways uh, in several cases. And we have found uh, in several cases that indoor air is a better indicator uh, of if you have a problem than a few sub slab soil gas samples. And maybe that is because uh, we are in Sweden where the chlorinated solvents have been banned for, well, 25 years now. So they, they aren't used in consumer products and so on. So we normally don't have a lot of background concentration here. Uh, so, so we can use it. Uh, thank you all for listening to me. Uh, the Q&A session will start now. Thank you, Nena, for your presentation. So before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download the PDF version of this presentation from the handout box on the dashboard. We have a lot of questions coming through. I will start with the first one. What guidelines are used to determine the health, sorry, the human health risk from the, me from the measured vapor? What guidelines are used to determine the human health risk from the measured vapor? Okay, that, that depends if you if you go on soil gas uh, vapor, I guess, or if you go on uh, the indoor air. When, when we measure, measure indoor air concentration, we we compare them to normal uh, low risk reference concentration that that we have both from the Swedish EPA and and also from the World Health Organization and so on for for contaminants that we don't have here in Sweden. Uh, but when we screen for soil gas, that's another question because here in Sweden we don't have soil gas uh, screening values. So we have to uh, take something from other countries. And I know in, in the States they have like, I think uh, a dilution factor of 30 and in Denmark they have a factor of 100. So we tend to go somewhere in in, in between that, so may, maybe 30 or uh, 100 times higher concentration could be allowed in the soil gas, um, just for screening and see, should we go further with this? Thank you. How does the camera inspection of pipe help in the screening? It, it helps if, if you can see uh, a lot of, uh, uh, if you really see that the pipes are in really bad condition, then you can uh, see that this could be a, a preferential pathway. So it's good to do some kind of measure. But, but I would say in the screening, it's really better to uh, take to measure this, uh, the gas in the in the pipe than than doing the camera inspection. But it's good to, to quite soon see what shape the, the pipes are in. Thank you. How effective are three core screening? And can you just explain us more about this, please? Okay, yeah, three core. Uh, maybe I should move back to that. Uh, uh, no, uh, it, it, I mean, you just take this little uh, matchstick size of uh, of tree and uh, put it in this vial and, and measure it. And it, it's really effective. We, we see that because the tree take uh, the gas from a quite big volume of soil, it's, it's both from the groundwater, the shallow groundwater and from the soil gas. So it represents a, a much uh, bigger volume than what you would get with a soil sample or, or to some degree with a soil gas sample as well. And um, you, you can have a really low detection limit. So you normally see quite good, but it depends on, on uh, the conditions at the site. And it depends to some degree on the tree as well. But given that it's so quick, I mean, you can take this sample in, in 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, um, and it's not that expensive. It's like 100 euros or, or so for, for one sample. 
uh, it gets, gets a lot of information and, and especially when you're in an urban area where it's, uh, I mean, you could have pipes everywhere and it's difficult to drill and so on. It, it gives you really good information. Thank you. How have you managed sites where a contaminated groundwater table is in contact with the building slab, particularly when modeling or calculating a predicted predicted indoor air concentration? Okay, I think I understood the question. Yeah, that that is a problem because um, the normally these models, uh, like the Johnson Estinger and the Swedish EPA model. They are steady state models uh, that are, uh, they need to have an unsaturated zone between the building and the groundwater plume to be able to calculate, uh, to model the vapor transport. So, um, but there are actually at least one model that can handle when groundwater are in contact with uh, the basement, for example. Uh, and that's a model that's been uh, developed by my colleagues in Canada, in, in Vancouver. Uh, and Dr. Ian Hurst, uh, a very experienced vapor intrusion expert. So that's, that's a model that we have started to use in some cases for, for these cases. Thank you. Is there any vapor intrusion model that is more correct than the others? Um, that depends. I mean, like I said, Johnson and Ettinger is a steady state model and it does not include uh, biodegradation or sorption and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it overestimates the vapor intrusion. But still, uh, Johnson and Ettinger, and, uh, which is sort of the US EPA model, uh, and uh, almost all other models are based on this model, but the Johnson Ettinger is the most validated uh, model that I know of. It, it has been reviewed and peer reviewed in several papers and so on. So at least you know what you're dealing with when you, when you had the Johnson Ettinger model. But none of these models take these preferential pathways into account um, with the pipes and so on. So you have to be careful. Thank you. We have time for the last question. Um, what ty type of mitigation measure may be installed on an impacted site, for example, below future houses, to protect future houses from vapor intrusion from uh, chlorinated uh, solvent? Can you use, I, I guess, the question is. Um, I would say that I have not really much experience of mitigation, pro uh, mitigation techniques because uh, the Swedish uh, authorities are uh, a little bit, uh, they don't uh, trust uh, mitigation methods, so they want something else to be done. Uh, here in Sweden, what we do is that we, we have a lot of radon gas here, so we tend to use the same technique for uh, building um, better uh, foundations with, with less cracks and so on. Um, as one way of mitigating. But you can also have ventilated floors, uh, both under the building and, and when you have a building that you have vapor intrusion into, and you can do different kind of ceilings. But I think if you have a vapor intrusion in the problem in, the, in your building and it's not transported by pipes, ventilated floor is probably one of the best things you can do. Fantastic, thank you. So we are at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Lena. We have the contact details shown on the screen and I would like to thank Ola Tedis for joining today. Thank you very much for your time and thank you Lena for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.